Internet catfishing is extremely unethical and controversial for a variety of reasons, but the conversation around it online is very much lighthearted and comical, to say the least. I mean, everyone has at least one friend who's claimed to have been catfished before, you know, showing up to a date expecting to meet a hot girl or guy they've been chatting up for the last couple of weeks, only to find the pictures don't uh, necessarily match up to what showed up to the date. While certainly an uncomfortable scenario to be involved in, generally these catfishing situations don't end in any criminal activity. They mostly just end with all of your friends making fun of you for falling for an obvious catfish. But with that said, there is some seriously messed up stuff occurring on the internet regarding catfishing. Situations involving deceitful individuals masquerading as others, trapping people in honeypot schemes in an effort to commit heinous crimes all the way up to murder. Today I'll be telling you the dark stories of the internet's most notorious catfish. Today's video is sponsored by Factor. Factor makes meeting your daily nutritional goals easy, shipping fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved gourmet meals right to your front door. If you find yourself too busy to cook, Factor cuts out the trip to the grocery store and brings delicious food right to your table almost instantly. All you gotta do is heat these bad boys up and you've got a succulent spread in about two minutes flat. One of my personal favorites from Factor right now is the pork tenderloin, cheesy cabbage, and green bean tray. Now, when it comes to a hearty meal in a couple of minutes, you really can't beat this. The pork is tender and savory, and the cheesy cabbage is a killer side dish with this. A scrumptious meal that requires you cleaning no dishes after it's enjoyed. And for those of you out there with a New Year's resolution or weight loss goal, Factor has something for you. Meals like the roasted veggie and pesto tortellini with green beans. This calorie smart meal is packed with flavor and at only 410 calories per tray. Factor has a vast selection selection of meals making it easy for you to personalize your trays based off your macronutrient needs. If you're slimming down, hit the calorie smart and they even got some trays for you out there that are trying to bulk up this year. So with all that said, you guys can go to factor75.com or click the link below in the description and use code wavy50 at checkout to get 50% off your first factor box. It's a hell of a deal. Check it out. Big thanks to factor for sponsoring and let's get on to the story. Catfishing generally results in nothing more than heartbreak and some confusion. However, on rare occasions, it can result in death. Sadly, the story that I'm detailing now involves such a scenario. It's a story showcasing a deceptive catfishing scam that manipulated a 74-year-old Tennessee school teacher, a scheme that results in the untimely death of this poor man. Now, the name of the victim in this story isn't public information as his identity is being protected. But what is known about this man is that at the time of the crime, he was an elderly retired school teacher who enjoyed football, golf, and spending time with his grandchildren. The 74-year-old man lived in Jonesboro, Tennessee, but in August of 2023, he would become ensnared in a sinister scheme that changed his life for the worse. Apparently around this time, the 74-year-old man had developed an online relationship with who he thought was a famous female celebrity. The exact celebrity's name in this case has been redacted. And now this celebrity was obviously fake and you've got a situation where somebody online is posing as a famous person and tricking and manipulating a senior citizen, frankly, to fall in love with them and potentially do favors for him. You know, the guy probably lonely and just desperate for attention. Yes, what this 74 year old man didn't realize was is that he was being swindled and manipulated by two individuals, a 34 year old man named Chinagoram Omniware and a 27 year old woman named Salma Abdal Karim, both hailing from New Jersey. In all reality, these two individuals were nefarious scammers looking to manipulate an old man who didn't know how to navigate the online world. Curiously, the 34-year-old man involved in this scheme was a recently minted member of the Army National Guard who was designated to a finance unit as a specialist. Their 74-year-old victim would unknowingly send the pair an enormous amount of money as they performed the ruse of being a prominent female celebrity. 
They developed a rapport with the retired teacher and engaged in intimate back and forth conversations through emails. Photography would be exchanged as well with the teacher reportedly sending photos and I'm sure the scammers, you know, would just take random images from the internet and send this guy. So just as this 74 year old man thinks that he's about to get in a relationship with a famous celebrity, that's when the scammers really turn up the heat and start fucking with them severely. In October of 2023, the 74-year-old man would receive an email from the email address unitedstates.fb28373 at gmail.com. This was an email claiming that the celebrity he had been messaging would be suing him for sexual harassment. However, the email would clarify that they would be willing to settle out of court for a small price. And needless to say, the scammers were behind this as well. The senior citizen would fall for the trap and sent over several checks over the course of three days to who he thought was the United States FBI. One check for 4,500 was made out to a company that was registered to the man involved in the scam. Another was issued to, quote, Agent Salma Abdal Karim, which if you didn't notice was the name of the female scammer. The man would mail this check out to the address they gave him making it payable to the FBI. But when he informed the fake FBI email that he had sent the check, he was scolded by the account because naturally they couldn't take this check to the bank if it was issued to the FBI. Because of this action, they would then threaten to raise the amount that he had to pay them. The scammers increasing the penalty to $40,000. On October 5th, 2023, the Tennessee man would travel to his bank in Johnson City, Tennessee and retrieve a cashier's check for $41,000 payable to the 34-year-old male scammer. He would then send the check to an address in Tacoma Park, Maryland. And even after doing this, they still press for more money, as he would be instructed to send another check, this time for $25,000 to the female scammer in New Jersey. The blackmail would get so extensive that the retired teacher had to take out a $25,000 loan against his personal vehicle in order to free up enough funds to pay them. It's been reported that by the time this was all said and done, the scammers had extracted over $90,000 from this poor man. With this insurmountable debt piling up and feeling as if he was about to get sued, the elderly man didn't see a way out of his circumstances. And on October 23rd of 2023, he made the decision to take his own life. The man was discovered dead sometime later in his home. He had shot himself. Initially, everyone was confused as to why he would take such an action, as on the surface, he was a pretty well-adjusted and happy guy. But the truth of what had transpired and the scammers that had tormented this guy all of it would come to light. Two days after his death, the family of the deceased man would bring his electronic tablet to the authorities as they were concerned after discovering the email exchanges between the elderly man and the predatory scammers that were taking advantage of him. Investigators would comb through the emails and find evidence of such a scam, which convinced law enforcement that the extortion was the result of the man's self-inflicted death. Naturally, the next move was to identify the scammers and bring them to justice. Now, usually romance scams are hard to prosecute because the perpetrators are located in different countries most of the time and you have to go about a lengthy process of extraditing them and finding them which can oftentimes prove to be impossible. However, in this case, the perpetrators of the scam were in New Jersey and they had given the man their government names on checks. So they knew exactly who did it. There was no sophistication in this scam. It was straightforward and the two had left a paper trail right to their front doorstep. On October 26th of 2023, investigators would subpoena the Navy Federal Union in Colt Neck, New Jersey, where Salma Abdukarin had negotiated the check earlier in the month. On November 1st, 2023, the subpoena would return with the names of the scammers and their address in New Jersey. Investigators would then get their hands on some video footage and were able to identify the scamming pair depositing the checks at an ATM. This would lead to a search warrant being executed on November 9th of 2023 at the Piscataway address where they would discover an envelope from the deceased victim that was addressed to the FBI. 
the two scammers were taken in for an interview, in which they admitted that it was them in the footage depositing the checks, but each gave conflicting stories on what the checks were for. The woman claimed to have been receiving checks so that she could help Nigerians buy cars in the United States, while the man claimed they had been getting money from Nigeria for a friend that he had met in the army. Both of them were promptly arrested due to the enormous amount of evidence against them and extradited to Tennessee. Anwamer and Alba Karim are each charged with the following, three counts of extortion, three counts of financial exploitation of an elderly slash vulnerable person, two counts of theft over $60,000, and two counts of criminal impersonation. A $500,000 bond was placed on both suspects. The trial regarding these two isn't complete at this moment. We'll just have to see what happens with these two. But regardless, that was the story of the elderly man who got catfished. This catfishing story is one of the most disturbing cases that I've seen personally. It involves an 18-year-old collegiate football player getting catfished, and in the process of this, somebody gets killed. In April of 2021, Isi Atute was an 18-year-old freshman linebacker for Virginia Tech University. The 18-year-old was an early enrollee, which meant that he had skipped the second semester of his senior year of high school so that he could enroll in college early. E.C. Mimmon was a gifted athlete and had physical prowess, standing at 6'3 and weighing 220 pounds. While excited to start practicing for football and meeting his teammates, unfortunately for E.C. Mimmon, the COVID-19 pandemic would happen, basically putting everybody into isolation. Yes, unfortunately, the new college student didn't have much time to make friends due to him spending most of the time in isolation due to the COVID-19 virus. But as the rules around the pandemic began to loosen up, a two Atute would find some companionship in other regards, as Atute would start hitting up girls on Tinder. On Tinder, the college athlete would match with a woman named Angie Renee, who had described herself in her profile as a 28-year-old physician at a family health clinic. As the two exchanged messages with each other, flirting would evolve into them wanting to meet up in real life. Before meeting up, though, Angie would convey to Isamimen in messages that they had to keep their relationship low profile as she didn't want anybody from her work to find out apparently explaining that it would be unprofessional for whatever reason. At the time, Isi Mimin didn't question her explanation, but he was a bit nervous as he had never met up with somebody from a dating app before. The 18-year-old would ask her if he could bring a friend along with him when they met, and according to reports, this Angie account replied saying yes, that was fine, and not only that, said that they would have sex with both Isi Mimin and the friend. So Isi Mimin and his teammate, Deshaun Elder, rode scooters to meet up with Angie at her apartment above the Hokey Mart in Blacksburg, Virginia. The two entered the complex through an alleyway and went up a flight of stairs and down a long hallway towards Angie's apartment door, which Angie already had propped open for them. A quote from Deshaun Elder reflecting on this situation, quote, I was scared instantly. It was just dark and I didn't really like the whole atmosphere. And yes, this situation, which has been described by testimony given from Deshaun Elder and Atute after the fact, it does seem like quite the dark scenario. So according to testimony, the apartment room was incredibly dark with only some light creeping through the kitchen window. And it said Angie would come out and her face was cloaked with a sweatshirt. It's starting to sound like some eyes wide shut type shit, you know what I'm saying? Angie would then lead Atute and his teammate to her bedroom. And while they were being escorted, Deshaun John Elder really got a bad feeling about all this and dipped out of the apartment, leaving Atute by himself. Now, Atute, though, he was still willing to see all of this out. He would follow Angie into her bedroom, to which Angie would then go on to perform uh, oral sex on the 18-year-old. Angie would proceed to give Atute fellatio within the poorly lit space for approximately seven to eight minutes. Meanwhile, Deshaun Elder, who was still in the area, started to feel as if he needed to go back and check on Atute, thinking that something bad could have happened to him. So... He goes back into the apartment and checks on his friend. Hearing Deshaun Elder approaching, Atute pulled his pants up and met his friend. Angie, still masqueraded, would give Atute $50 and the football players were sent on their way. Now, it goes without saying this was quite the bizarre and unsettling situation. I mean, 
Atute pretty much got head from a stranger claiming to be a woman wearing a fucking mask, essentially. Atute would head home and tell his fellow teammates about the bizarre experience that he had. Some teammates got hype about it, but others were sort of concerned like, dude, you could have gotten an STD or something here. Some even questioned like, bro, was it even a woman? Like, did you see her face? The latter in particular there would become a big joking point that the teammates would tease Atute with, like, yo, you could have actually just gotten head from a dude. But Atute would write all of this teasing off as a joke and was pretty sure that it was a chick. He since said, quote, I was still sure it was a female, but it was possible. Now things start to get creepier as Angie would continue to text Atute after the fact. Angie would continuously text Atute, wanting him to return, but the football player, creeped out by the initial encounter, would eventually block her number. However, Atute would then begin to receive texts from other cell phone numbers, which were claiming to be Angie. He did his best to block these as well, and as the semester drew to a close and classes ended, Atute would go back home to Virginia Beach. Though the encounter with Angie was still weighing heavy on his mind. Around this time, it said that Atute would confide in a friend, detailing how this situation had deeply disturbed him. And as more time passed, he began to take the jokes that his friends were making to heart and actually felt that he may have been catfished or uh, sexually, you know, manipulated by a man. The friend that he confided this in told Atute that he should try to seek out Angie again so he could confirm for himself if this was the case. And eventually, the football player would decide to make this his mission. When Atute returned back to campus for school, he would discover that one of his teammates had matched up with Angie, and the messaging style of this Angie account followed a similar formula to how Atute had interacted with the woman. And believe it or not, this teammate would actually go to Angie's house just like Atute did, but things were a bit different this time. While the room was dark and Angie was masked up like Atute's experience, what this student did was ask the woman a bunch of questions, even at one point asking to see her face, but Angie would refuse. This teammate felt extremely sketched out and decided to leave before anything else happened. After the fact, Angie would angrily text this teammate later and claim that if he was worried about the legitimacy of her operation, he should talk to Atute claiming that he would vouch for her. After learning that another teammate had experienced Angie, Atute would talk to this individual and ask if they thought that Angie could have been a man. And it's been reported that the teammate entertained the idea and said it was possible. Following this, Angie would text Atute again from some random number, asking him to put in a good word for the teammate that got scared away. And Atute saw this as his opportunity to get closure on the situation. He was going to find out the truth about Angie. So him and his teammates grouped up and would go to the Angie apartment to find out once and for all the truth about this person. So Atute would go meet Angie again. On May 31st of 2021, with his teammates waiting for him outside, he entered the apartment. It was the same setup. All lights were off, Angie would lead him to the bedroom with their face veiled, and once in the bedroom, Atute would activate his plan. Now, it said at this point, Atute reached out to put his hand on the woman's lower region, and Angie grabs his hand and puts it on her crotch. And, well, uh, Angie wasn't to her after all there was a penis to be found there. Now, at this point, things start to get violent. Atute would panic after this realization, reaching for his phone and turning on the flashlight, directing the light at Angie's face, only to find a middle-aged man with short, dark hair and stubble. Testimony describing the encounter, Atute says, why didn't you tell me you was a man? Completely freaked out and disgusted, it's alleged that Atute slapped Angie's hand away from him and punched Angie in the jaw, knocking them to the floor. Atute allegedly continued to pummel Angie as the middle-aged man laid prone on the ground. Atute would then allegedly kick the catfish twice and run for the door, leaving a trail of bloody footprints. The group would leave Angie on the ground bloodied up. They left the apartment. Nobody called the police about the matter. Reflecting on this, Atute has said, quote, I wouldn't even say I was angry. I was destroyed. I just felt violated and lied to and just tricked into doing sexual acts. Yes, what this violent encounter revealed is that there never really was an Angie. 
In fact, Angie was actually 40-year-old Jerry Smith. And Jerry Smith, well, this man was killed during a Tutte's last visit. On June 1st, 2021, Jerry's dead body would be found by his brother and nephew. When police would arrive at the site of the killing, it said that the body of Smith was barely recognizable. Multiple teeth had been knocked out and Jerry had injuries to his eyes and lips. A medical examiner explained that his death was related to inhalation of blood. And although they couldn't determine when he actually died, they said it was possible that he laid there hours before breathing his last breath. It was discovered that Jerry Smith had multiple accounts on social media, including Tinder, Facebook, Twitter, etc., in which he would catfish straight men as a 28-year-old woman. The photos that Jerry used to catfish his victims were that of a former college student that he had never met before. Smith also had something of a reputation with law enforcement over the years, as he had been arrested for for a plethora of crimes including fraud, sexual battery, and had been accused of harassment and assault on several occasions. Smith was also involved in another situation similar to this in which a mother had caught her underage son messaging a woman named Angie occurring on Facebook in 2015. This woman would hire a private investigator to track down Jerry, but charges were never filed over the matter. So now that we have an idea of who Angie really was, what would happen to Atute? Would this be considered murder or some form of self-defense? Atute would first be implicated for the killing of Mr. Smith as security footage was able to capture Atute dashing out of the apartment and the blood-soaked footprints were noted within Jerry's room. As a result of this evidence, police would arrest Atute two days later. When police arrived to pick him up, Ismim and Atute immediately knew why they had come. In the interrogation, Ismim and Atute would explain that he found himself upset in the moment because in his words, quote, he got his dick sucked by a dude, unquote. When told about Jerry Smith's death, Atute broke down into tears and would later say in the interview that he saw his future disintegrating in front of him. After the interrogation, police would perform a more thorough search of Jerry Smith's apartment. And during this search, they would find a knife under his mattress on the left side of the bed where he would instruct Atute to perform sexual acts. The discovery of this knife would become a key element in Atute's defense in the coming trial. Ismim Atute was being charged with second-degree murder, which carried a maximum prison sentence of 40 years. And on the surface, it does kind of look like there would be an easy time for prosecutors to convict Atute for killing this guy. But as more time passed, evidence would come forward showcasing the true monster that Jerry Smith actually was. As Atute was awaiting trial, alleged victims would reach out to authorities regarding their own personal previous interactions with Jerry Smith. And how they'd receive random messages from Angie Renee on Facebook. Many of them claimed that they were invited to the apartment just above the Hokey Mart like Atute was, some of them falling for the same sexual traps. These victims of Jerry Smith would reach out to Atute's defense team with their own stories, which would help their case tremendously as they were beginning to paint a picture of who Jerry Smith really was, a habitual predator catfish who had been sexually assaulting men for decades. Almost a year to the day of Jerry Smith's death is when the trial began in the Montgomery County Courthouse in Christiansburg, Virginia. Atute's defense adamantly proclaimed that he was lured into the apartment by a predator and was being preyed on by Jerry Smith. They also showed evidence that Smith had a reputation of preying on young black men to feed sexual desires. The prosecution, however, would focus on the facts of the incident itself. They would look at the autopsy, which showed that almost every bone in Jerry Smith's face had been broken and that he had died from blunt force trauma. The prosecution says, there's a lot to unpack in this case, and Mr. Atute had every right to be angry at the situation, but Paul Jerry Smith did not deserve to die. Now, the defense would take an interesting angle in defending their client. They would reveal that before Atute entered the apartment to meet Angie for the second time, he was told to be careful by one of his roommates and to be weary of any weapons like a gun that Angie may have hidden. The defense would argue that during the altercation, Jerry Smith would reach back towards the bed, and Atute thought this action was Jerry Smith pulling out a hidden gun. Therefore, the prosecution's point of Atute just turning around and running away was off the table because if Jerry had a gun, then Atute was vulnerable and couldn't just make his exit peacefully. So they claim it's the thought of this threat of a gun that sort of made it self-defense. And although Atute 
Kente was unaware of the knife underneath the mattress. Defense argued the fact that if it was there, it at least shows that Jerry Smith was potentially dangerous. And of course, Jerry Smith's past was brought up by the defense, with them essentially painting the man as a repeat serial sexual offender. Atute would testify himself at one point in the trial, stating, quote, I was destroyed. I would never intentionally try to harm anyone, especially to the point of death, ever. I've never gotten into a fight my whole life and those were not my intentions at all. In closing arguments, his defense attorney would explain that Atute would be the type of son he would like to have, and this would cause the attorney to break out into tears when discussing this. The prosecutors would urge the jury to ignore the theatrics and focus on the facts of the case, they said, urging them to consider, at the very least, voluntary manslaughter. The jury would deliberate only three hours before reaching a verdict, and Atute was found not guilty. Atute's family and friends celebrated within the courtroom as this was announced, and Atute dropped to his knees in relief. So yeah, it appears that the jury believed that uh, Jerry Smith was indeed a serial sexual assaulter, a dangerous man that could have potentially killed Atute, and Atute fighting back was justified. And it seems as if they believe Atute didn't even intentionally try to kill this guy. Now this was quite a high profile trial, and Atute was reached out to by many media outlets in the wake of the decision. This is what he has to say about Jerry Smith. The only thing that I could take from it is just at least they're not going to be able to do this to anyone else. If let's say I was even locked up right now, I'd just be thinking, at least he's not doing this to more people and just messing up people's lives. After all this was finally said and done, Atute would uh, live out his life as a normal college student and would go on to play football. Atute would find a spot on the football team roster for Iowa Western Junior College, where he plays to this day. His first year on the team, they would win a junior college national championship, finishing with a 10-2 record final word from Atute. I never would have thought I'd be responsible for taking a life. I always feel bad about it, but at the same time, I just try to move forward. I ask for forgiveness every day. Most catfishing is done by masquerading as someone else physically or being disingenuous about your appearance using, you know, uh, modified photos. But there also exists a different genre of catfishing where you're not necessarily misrepresenting how you look, you're just misrepresenting literally everything else about you. You know, marital status, what you do for a living, interests, who the fuck you are. There's some out there that pretend to be single bachelors frolicking around on these dating apps while they have a wife and kid at home. Dating and seducing countless women at a time with these girls, you know, perhaps thinking they're some sort of rock star or model when they're actually like a fucking plumber that has uh, five kids at home. And that's not to say there isn't anything glamorous about being a plumber. Trade jobs are the shit. Some of you out there might think it's a bit humorous that there are folks out there on dating apps basically making up entire fake life stories about themselves to get sex and you know romantic partnership but what you got to know is that this can actually be illegal I mean it is essentially a form of fraud right which brings us to the story of Yosef Pariser a man who was once a well-respected rabbi but now his reputation and his freedom is in complete jeopardy after he catfished a bunch of women we got catfishing rabbis out here boys 35-year-old Yosef Mordecai Pariser is a married rabbi from Israel and a father of two children. Yosef was originally from New York City but moved to Israel around 2013 after he began teaching at an Orthodox Jewish school for foreign students. If you would have spoke to Yosef around this time, he would have claimed to have been happily married. But in all reality, this very likely wasn't the case as he was reportedly engaging in quite a bit of infidelity using catfishing tactics. Yes, behind the scenes the rabbi get up would come off and Yosef has been described as a secular dating app Romeo of sorts. It's been reported that Yosef would go online to find single women and would use aliases such as Jake Westman and Jake Seagal to interact with females on dating apps like Tinder and Bumble. He allegedly came up with an entirely fake alias and alter ego and claimed that he worked as a dog trainer. 
Yosef is alleged of talking to these women in an effort to seduce them and saying that he wanted to start long-term romantic partnerships with them, all while having a whole wife and kids. It's been reported that one of the girls that he dated while using his dog trainer alter ego went so well that he actually met the parents of this woman, but things fell apart after the mother of the woman grew worried after meeting him in person. She felt suspicious of the guy, let's just say that. As any mother with too much spare time would, she decided decided to research everything that she possibly could about this uh, dog trainer guy online. And well, she was having trouble finding information about him. When searching up the man's fictitious name, she couldn't find anything about him or his occupation, and the Jewish community apparently had no idea who he was. These concerns would be passed to the woman that he was dating, and she would confront Yosef about it. When Yosef was confronted about this, he had a panic attack and would proceed to break up with her. According to the Daily Mail, after this incident, Yosef would continue on with his Casanova-like bad bachelor lifestyle, his tactics got so degenerate that it's been reported by the Jerusalem Post that Yosef had an extramarital relationship with one woman for close to seven years. Seven years she unknowingly dated a guy that had a whole fucking wife and kids. In a situation that could be compared to a mediocre sitcom bit from the 1990s, Yosef's whole bachelor catfishing scheme was busted when some of the women that he was secretly dating found out about each other, which resulted in the whole scheme blowing up in his face. Yosef was playing fast and loose with these girls, and eventually when enough of them got suspicious, they started digging into him and they found each other. A few of the women began to notice red flags while dating Yosef, as he reportedly never invited them to his apartment, and he very rarely would spend weekends with them, claiming that he had to observe the Jewish Sabbath with his roommates which I could only presume was his actual family. It's been reported that after Yosef's alleged victims found one another, they had an emotionally charged conversation about being hoodwinked, and then decided it would be best to band together to confront the rabbi. So they teamed up and confronted him on his bullshit. When confronted, Yosef tried to explain that he suffered from depression and attempted to still conceal his real identity, even after the girls had figured him out. And at this point, the women only thought that Yosef was a serial cheater. They didn't even really know about the rabbi part and him having a family and when they decided that element of the story that's when they went public and went to the media oh and did they have some allegations to put against the guy the women would go on to make a joint statement publicly accusing yosef of committing rape given that all of these women allegedly had consensual sex with him under false pretense due to yosef allegedly using a plethora of false identities Within the legal definition, in Israel, this could be considered a criminal offense and is defined as actual rape. Altogether, seven women came forward. Yosef would be arrested on suspicion of rape through fraud in August of 2023. In the wake of his arrest, authorities would release the alleged catfish's profile pictures from dating apps so other potential victims could possibly come forward. This strategy would prove useful as more than a dozen women have come forward after Yosef's arrest. It was also also announced that Yosef had been terminated from his position as a rabbi at the school. After being arrested, Yosef's lawyers would fire back claiming that while his actions were unethical, they weren't technically illegal, at least they claim. Quote, all social media networks, especially dating apps, are full of lies. Every adult knows this, so anyone claiming these were serious relationships lacks logic and common sense. Quote, once we have all the material for the case, we will be able to prove that. It wouldn't be long before even more women would come forward, and an indictment was filed against Yosef, alleging him of deceiving 30 women into simultaneous relationships while using a different persona. And as of September 2023, his custody was extended by the court. Given the tumultuous ongoing events that are happening in Israel right now, the story has gone cold, so there's not been any big updates regarding it. We'll just have to see what happens with the married rabbi that allegedly catfished over 30 women in a span of 10 years. What you may or may not be surprised to find is that some of the catfish that were on the popular MTV show Catfish, you know, the show that basically popularized and created this term, they turned out to be criminals after being featured on the show. 
Those of you who watched cable television back in the 2010s certainly remember Catfish. It was the show created by Nev Shulman and was based on his 2010 documentary, Catfish. During the successful series, there were quite a few episodes that raised eyebrows across the country. One in particular that we'll be looking at was an episode in season three, where one catfisher would be exposed as a complete fraud. It's the case of Kid Cole, a catfish who masqueraded as someone who worked in the music industry only to later get thrown in jail for making bizarre terroristic threats. The episode that introduced Kid Cole to the world was aired on May 28th of 2014. In this episode, a young woman named Lucille from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania reaches out to Nev Shulman and his team after growing weary of Kid Cole, a self-described music producer who she had met online and had been working with for some time. Apparently, this woman developed somewhat of a big brother other little sister dynamic with Cole. Lucille aspired to get into the music industry and Kid Cole claimed he was an insider that could make that happen and act as her mentor. Lucille was told by Kid Cole that he was signed to Kanye West's record label Good Music at the time. The two would first interact after Lucille had listened to a few of his beats posted to SoundCloud. Feeling like Kid Cole had talent, she reached out to him on Twitter, which resulted in them becoming online friends of sorts. But Kid Cole, let's just say he was no friend. For all intents and purposes, Lucille would be conned into aiding Kid Cole in his work as a quote, music producer. Fronting the man money for his totally legit business ordeals, which were managed by his totally legit manager, a man named Miguel. Lucille would even go as far as booking shows for Kid Cole. But eventually the nature of his deceptive scheme would come forward. Soon, Lucille would be sent a large amount of invoices from businesses that had exchanged services with Kid Cole, which included security services and a driver. Altogether, she was being billed over $23,000. Afterwards, it would be found out that this Kid Cole person was running an elaborate scam and using Lucille as his proxy. The contracts issued out to workers were completely fake with no contact information whatsoever, and Lucille was left to weather the storm while the business manager Miguel had gone completely dark online. Lucille was also subject to much trauma dumping and manipulation from Kid Cole. Anytime that she, you know, felt uncomfortable about handing over money, the guy would basically throw tantrums, she would feel bad for him, and continue the vicious cycle. During their research, the hosts of Catfish would find that a lot of Kid Cole's beats weren't actually attributed to him, and he was just ripping them off from other musicians. He wasn't talented at all, he was just a thief, basically. The Kid Cole deception would all come crumbling down after the Catfish crew discovered that both the phone numbers belonging to Kid Cole and his supposed manager, Miguel, were registered to an individual named Stone Cold Jerez, real name Jerez Coleman. Kid Cole and Miguel were the same person. And to top it all off, while searching the name Jerez Coleman online, they apparently discovered that other individuals had fallen victim to his scams, as there was a Facebook page warning individuals about Kid Cole and Jerez. Kid Cole wasn't a real musician, he wasn't particularly talented, and he certainly wasn't signed to Kanye's record label. He was a fraud and had been exposed. After being caught, Kid Cole would completely admit to his actions. Now, Catfish is a reality show. Certainly some elements of this story were played up and Despite participating in some pretty sketchy activity, Kid Cole was never actually sent to jail or given any sort of charges. But sometime after the show had concluded, Jerez or Kid Cole would get locked up for a different crime entirely, one that you're likely not expecting. In December of 2014, six months after his episode of Catfish had aired, the fraudulent aspiring music producer would allegedly make terroristic phone calls all throughout the Washington, D.C. area. We're talking about calls made to metro stations, bus stations, train stations, pretty much any sort of facility dealing with public transit. 
Jerez or Kid Cole would be caught and arrested and would admit to everything, which included Coleman placing an estimated 12 phone calls and he also reportedly called 911 over 300 times during this stint. Some calls included Cole announcing his intentions to take a bus hostage for a $15 million ransom. He even called in to falsely report that President Barack Obama was in danger. Other news sources report that he actually made threats to assassinate the president at some point. Almost every call that he would make elicited a police response and a disruption in civil services. Jerez Coleman would eventually plead guilty in federal court to his charges which included making threats that involved explosive materials. And in May of 2015, one year after his episode had aired, Jerez Coleman would be sentenced to serve 21 months in prison for his crimes. And Jerez's degeneracy wouldn't end with prison. In 2022, Jerez Coleman was reportedly arrested for theft between $25,000 and $100,000, as well as two counts of identity theft and failure to appear for a pretrial hearing. I'm unable to ascertain what has become of this case, but that's where we're at with the story of Kid Cole, one of Catfish's most infamous stars. One such disturbing catfishing case occurred somewhat recently. It involves a police officer posing as a 17-year-old boy in an effort to kidnap a 13-year-old girl. And the outcome of this monstrous endeavor is worse than you could ever imagine. Let's introduce our depraved perpetrator, Austin Lee Edwards. Austin Lee Edwards, 28 years old at the time, worked as a policeman. He began his tenure with the Virginia State Police Department in July of 2021. The man was subjected to a background check upon hiring, but despite having something of a dubious personal history, which we'll discuss shortly, Edwards was hired as a cop. During his time as an officer, he was subjected to monthly performance evaluations. During these evaluations, the man showed no signs of any sort of disturbing behavior that would trigger an internal investigation, and Austin Edwards would be allowed to find more work as an officer after leaving the Virginia State Police. You see, Austin Edwards had a devious history of personal misconduct. This misconduct culminating in an intense perversion that wasn't observable in plain sight as it was hidden online. Throughout the years, Austin Edwards would habitually message underaged girls. During one instance in October of 2014, Edwards would interact with a minor that was only 13 years old at the time that he had met on Omegle. The two would exchange over 4,000 messages with each other over the next two years. One message reportedly sent by Edwards on November 6th of 2014 read, Did I tell you I went trick-or-treating? I totally did. Am 20. The 13-year-old girl writes back, Me too. Nothing creepy going on here, right? It wouldn't be long before Austin Edwards' conversation with this minor would regress from funny memes and trick-or-treating updates to far more inappropriate content as the two began talking in Skype calls where Edwards would make things abhorrently sexual, with the man going as far as allegedly masturbating on these calls and begging the young minor to undress. Doing so quite aggressively, might I add. Yo, what the fuck? I said I wanted tits waiting on me when I got back. The girl reportedly replied, I'm sorry. According to a report from the New York Post, Austin would display further aggressive behavior in these chat logs, insinuating harm would come if she didn't bend to his demands. One instance cited by the publication stated that if she denied him naked pictures, Austin would threaten violence. The 20-year-old man would grow incredibly attached to the 13-year-old, referring to her as his girlfriend on many occasions. These circumstances would grow even more disturbing in 2015 as Edwards would beg the minor to get into a call with him, but when she refused, due to her mother being home at the time, Edwards replied, kill her. I think you sort of get the gist of what Austin Edwards is doing here with this initial underage contact that he was frequently communicating with. The man frequently was requesting illicit images and when he didn't get his way, he would threaten self-harm or that he was going to harm the girl or her family. This pattern of abuse would continue until the girl would eventually block Austin Edwards. He would ceaselessly try to find her through other social media apps like Facebook. 
But eventually the girl managed to get the man blocked across all social media and he couldn't make any contact with her, setting him over the edge. Just two weeks after the minor had completely ceased contact with him, Edwards would reportedly attempt to take his own life with a hatchet. According to the New York Post, Austin's father would find him and call the authorities where the father would tell them that Austin had been drinking and was having issues with his girlfriend. It's speculated that the person his father thought was Austin's girlfriend was this 13 or 14 year old. After this incident, Austin Edwards would be submitted for a psychiatric evaluation. During this, a judge ordered that he could not purchase, own, or transport any sort of firearms. Edwards would continue to seek out the girl and actually attempted to get in touch with her as late as April of 2020, after she had turned 18. During this time, the young woman replied and told Edwards to never contact him again. This would mark the end of his interactions with the once 13 year old victim, his initial target if you will. Keep in mind, this is an individual that would become a state trooper. And sadly, this 13 year old wouldn't be his only victim. This time, employing catfishing schemes, posing as a 17 year old boy to get close to another minor. The next portion of his story begins years later. Austin's psychological record had gone unnoticed. Going unnoticed allowed him to be hired by the Virginia State Police Department. He would work this job for some time and get another job as a policeman in November of 2022 at the Washington County Police Department in Virginia. Despite the man having orders from a judge to not own or possess any firearms, he's getting jobs as a cop. Yes, in reality, despite being a policeman, Austin had active orders forbidding him to possess a firearm. There was no legal record of any sort of petition against this order or anything about it being overturned. The police departments had just completely overlooked it or they just didn't care. So basically, this groomer slash pedophile who had been scouring the internet for possible underage victims that he could manipulate and entangle in his deceitful game of cat and mouse was able to work not only with firearms, but was in an authoritative position that could allow him to take even further advantage of victims. And that's exactly what he would do. Austin Edwards was able to continue his disgusting career as a virtual predator and was now cloaked with an online persona portraying himself as a 17 year old teenage boy, which made it even easier for him to approached underage girls. Working as a policeman and moonlighting as a predator, Austin Edwards behind closed doors would message young minors and take advantage of them in various ways. One such instance of this is the tragic case of a 15 year old girl from Riverside, California. This girl's name is not publicly known, but what Austin would do to this girl in her family would become national news. Online, Austin Edwards would exchange information with this girl to the point where he found out exactly where she lived. And in late November of 2022, Austin decided to evolve from a virtual predator to a real life one, as he would end up driving 24 hours across the country from Virginia to California with the goal of abducting this girl. On November 25th of 2022, Austin arrived early at the girl's residence at 6.58 a.m. It's reported that he walked back and forth from his car twice and then left in his Kia. This initial visit likely some sort of scouting mission by the man. A couple hours later, Austin would return to the property at 9 a.m to find that the house was occupied by the minor's 69-year-old grandfather, Mark Winnick, and Mark's wife, 65-year-old Sherry Winnick. Believing that the 15-year-old he was after was inside as well, this is when he sets his plan into motion. Austin was able to approach and gain access to the house by pretending to be a detective who was investigating a case involving the minor. So, you know, he comes to the house, knocks on the door, poses as a detective, and tells the grandparents that you know, their 15 year old girl has some sort of, you know, case that she's involved in or some sort of activity that needs to be investigated. The family was panicked at first as the alleged detective showed his badge and badge number and requested to speak to the 15 year old immediately. However, the girl wasn't actually at home at the time. She was out with her sister and her mother, her mother being 38 year old Brooke Winnick. After discovering this, Austin posing as a detective demanded that the grandparents immediately get in touch with the mother and the girl so that he could presumably get them to come back home and 
he could kidnap her. He said it was an urgent investigation that had to be dealt with immediately. So grandmother Sherry would get in touch with Brooke on the phone. And in this conversation, it was decided that Brooke would drop off the younger daughter at her house and bring the 15 year old that Austin was after to the grandparents' house so they could have a sort of interrogation slash questioning of the 15 year old. And sometime later, Sherry and the 15 year old daughter would arrive. It's important to note that during this entire encounter, grandmother Sherry is actually on the phone with her other daughter named Michelle Blandon. So there is like a third party listening in to what's going on during this situation when, you know, uh, Austin is confronting the mother and the daughter, etc. As Brooke and her daughter arrived, it was reported that Austin Edwards was somehow able to escort the 15 year old into his car under the guise of her waiting for questioning. He would then go back to talk to the family. There, he reportedly revealed that he had pictures of the interior of the house and wanted to confiscate the family's cell phones. At this time, as Sherry was on the phone with her other daughter, Michelle, Austin Edwards intervened, grabbing the phone and was able to take it and talk to her. The call log says, quote, I'm here with your mom. She's kind of being anxious and freaking out. Michelle Blandon says, my mother wants to be cooperative. Austin says, quote, everything is going to be okay. Everything is going to be okay. Austin Edwards then asked to be shown the 15 year old's room. At this point, he hung up the phone with Michelle. Michelle would try to call again, but there would be no answer. And sometime shortly after Michelle getting off the phone with Austin Edwards, that's when this tale takes a dark turn. As Austin Edwards would methodically proceed to end the lives of the mother, the grandfather, and the grandmother in the front entryway of the house. While this horrific act was underway, the young girl who had been patiently waiting in Austin's car decided to get out and investigate what was taking so long for the questioning. She went back inside the house to see what the holdup was, and there she saw a horrific sight, as Edwards had murdered the young girl's mother by slitting her throat, and he had hogtied her grandparents together and placed bags over their heads. The whole family was dead. Austin Edwards would then set the house on fire while holding the girl at gunpoint, to which he would then take her back to the car and drive away. Austin Edwards was now an at-large murderous catfish fugitive with a kidnapped girl in his possession. At some point during Austin's grisly visit to the miner's home, one of the neighbors observed the disturbance and called the police as Austin's Kia was actually parked in their driveway. The neighbor also reported having watched Edwards open the back passenger door of the vehicle and saw him rushing the neighbor's daughter into the vehicle, claiming they heard her say, help me. As Austin was driving away, that's when they called police. When police were on their way, they began to receive other calls about a fire that was being observed in the neighborhood. After arriving, authorities would find confirmation that something truly foul had occurred. All three victims of Austin's wrath were found in the front entryway. Police and fire would take them outside, but unfortunately all three were no longer breathing and resuscitation measures had no effect. It didn't take long to determine that they had been murdered and that the fire was intentionally started and that the girl was missing yeah, they had a criminal on their hands and they needed to get him fast. Police had a description of the vehicle, which was a red Kia Soul, and they put out a bulletin for the public to look out for it. Thankfully, a few hours would pass and officers were able to track down this vehicle in Kelso, California. Upon spotting Edwards driving in the Kia, officers began to pursue. When Austin noticed he was being followed by police, he escalated the situation, pulling out a gun and firing shots at them while driving. A high-speed chase would commence with Austin exchanging bullets with cops as he's speeding down the highway. Yet as quickly as the chase began, it would end. As at some point during it, Austin, noting a police helicopter above him, looked up to place a shot at this helicopter. But while doing so, he lost control of the vehicle and flung his car off the road, incapacitating it in the process. With his car stalled, police would get out and come in for the arrest. However, the man would never face justice. With the walls closing in around him, it's at this point where Austin would pull the gun on himself and take his own life with the panicked 15-year-old girl in the vehicle with him. With sirens blaring all around, police would get to the door and find the man dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Thankfully, the girl was, at least physically, unharmed. And then there's the aftermath of this situation, when the story goes national and everyone finds out about Austin Edwards' past as a sexual deviant and online predator 
and him being a police officer. As this tragedy unfolded within the public media, it was found out that Austin Edwards was working as a police officer and had recently transitioned into a new job as a deputy in Washington County, Virginia. He had been working there for two weeks at the time of him making his cross-country trek to kidnap the girl. His psychological evaluation from 2016 was uncovered as well, and it would become public that this evaluation had gone unnoticed due to, quote, human error by police. Or perhaps they just didn't think it was important. Whatever the case, the remaining family members of the girl announced that they planned on suing the police departments involved with Austin Edwards for their negligence, alleging that the departments had deliberately buried Edwards' psychological results when he was hired. In fact, they were able to obtain a legal notice in which Virginia State Police officials had ordered a mental health evaluation of Edwards after he had disclosed to them the 2016 incident. So it appears that Austin may have at one point told them about what had happened and they were like, well, let's just do a mental eval to see if you're okay now and uh, they just like let him work there still. Austin's other predatorial online escapades were also unearthed as well, and the media would be able to confirm the stories of the former 13-year-old who had been groomed by him back in 2014. It's a shame a fuss wasn't made about this stuff earlier. In regard to the surviving minor and her family, a GoFundMe would be set up to raise money for them. This fundraising attempt would secure over $100,000. On November 16th of 2023, Michelle Blandon, the family member that was on the phone who heard Austin masquerading as a detective in real time, filed a lawsuit in the California Central District against the Washington County Sheriff's Department, multiple members of the staff there, and Austin Edwards' estate. Law and Crime reports this about the details of the case. The heart of the argument against the sheriff's office is that it, quote, did not conduct an adequate investigation into Edwards' background before hiring him, unquote. And if it had done so, quote, they would have learned that he was detained for a psychiatric evaluation in February 2016 after threatening to kill himself and his father, unquote. Michelle Blandin says, quote, I am bringing this lawsuit because my family wants to know how Edwards was hired as a sheriff's deputy and given a gun when the courts expressly ordered he could not possess a firearm. In a statement to the Associated Press, she said, quote, he used his position as a sheriff to gain access to my parents' home where he killed them and my sister. I want the Washington County Sheriff's Office held accountable for giving a mentally unfit person a badge and a gun. The aforementioned lawsuit has provided four causes of action and seeks wrongful death damages, survival damages, including pain and suffering, loss of life damages, statutory damages under Golden State Law, and attorney fees. In what's likely one of the most disturbing stories involving catfishing, that was the story of Austin Edwards, the murderous cop catfish. Those were the internet's most notorious catfish. Let me know what you guys thought about this video down below in the comments section and let me know who or what you want me to talk about next. I want to give a major shout out to my patrons. I appreciate you guys. Wavy Web Surf out. Peace.